What a treat to be together. Oh, that worship this morning. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I live for that. I, I just, everywhere where God is moving, there's that kind of worship that is just so focused on the power and presence of God. It's so exalting of who Jesus is that you just get lost in his presence. And that's really the heart of, of, of true worship and pure worship. I, I'm, my task this morning is to be the closer in this month of dealing with holiness. And uh, if you've ever studied holiness, you know teaching holiness in an hour is incredibly difficult. And so I don't know how much I'm going to, I don't know how far I'm going to get this morning. But I, I want us to dive into this thing of holiness because I believe that the church is in desperate need of a revelation of the holiness of God. Yeah. If, you, if you responded in worship this morning, you will have been touched by the holiness of a God that's bigger than we understand, that we, that we can see, that we can imagine. And before we talk about the activity of holiness, we need to understand where that roots and that roots in who he is. This incredible majesty of our, of our God. Um, there are two, in the Old Testament, the word for holiness basically means a cutting off or a separation from anything that's unclean and a consecration to anything that's pure. So it's a separation from one thing, but it's a joining to another. There's always two parts in, in holiness. And too often we live with a cutting off and forget to be joined to. And if we're going to live in real holiness, it's the joining to, it's that union with Christ that is the most incredible part of holiness. That's the part that will keep us walking in holiness. Um, in the New Testament, the word holiness is the same root as the word saint or the word sanctify. So when you read sanctify or saint in scripture, you're, you're dealing with that idea of holiness, that idea of being cut off from one thing but joined to something else. That's the, that's the nature of this word holiness. And in it, both Old and New Testaments refer to an absolute holiness that is who God is, but it also refers to a I'm going to use the word, and I, I don't like it, but it's the only word I could find, an ethical holiness that, uh, that belongs to him that we emulate. Um, so, some writers call it behavioral holiness, but I struggle with that because it's more than behavior. Uh, yeah. We're not justified by our behavior. We're justified by our hearts being linked to the power and presence of God. So it's not just behavior. It's bigger than behavior. It's the way we think, the way we act. It's the motives of our heart. That, that's, and so the, the, both New and Old Testament have both those ideas of holiness. And I want to start this morning just looking just for a few minutes to start with at the absolute holiness of God. Because that's where this all comes from. And uh, having just studied this week, this week I, I worship got me really good today. So that was excellent. But, but there are several statements about holiness in the Old Testament that I want us to look at. Um, in, in Exodus chapter 11, verse 15, it talks about God is majestic in holiness. The word majestic talks about beauty. It talks about the, the, the dignity of who he is. It, 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 God is majestic in holiness. There, there's a majesty in it. Um, the, the, there, there was an old song we used to sing, Majesty, Worship His Majesty. That, that comes out of that revelation of His holiness. And that, that was actually written after somebody witnessed the, uh, one of the coronations in England. And they came back with this revelation of, of, of how incredible. If that's majesty, that is majesty. And just that revelation of who He is. There's a second verse that uh, talks about the splendor of holiness. And the uh, psalmist David talks about uh, the splendor of holiness. And here he's talking about the magnific magnificence of who God is. Just this incredible image of who he is, the grandeur of who he is. The, the, just God's amazing. 
And the more we glimpse who he is, the more it affects the way we live our life. And then we come over to Isaiah, and I, I, I love the book in Isaiah, and we're going to use that quite a bit today. But in I, Isaiah 6, 1, Isaiah uses this phrase that the train of his robe feel, fills the temple. What, what an incredible statement. The train of his robe fills the temple. Now, in our American culture, that really doesn't mean very much to us. But in a royalty culture, it means something incredible. The bigger the train is, the more authority, the more presence, the more power, the more prestige that kings take. Just take a peek at a picture here. In 1953, Queen Elizabeth was crowned as Queen Elizabeth II in England. Um, it, that was the year I arrived in Africa. Uh, my parents were missionaries. Um, it, it was at the height of the British Empire still functioning right after World War II and Britain was seen to have won the war and, and there was this there was this amazing royalty this this amazing presence and when King George died um, his daughter who was 25 came in uh, was crowned king uh, queen of England and, and at this coronation she she had a had a, a dress and a and a train that was more than 20 feet long. It took 3,500 hours for the, the, the people to sew the gold thread into the train that she wore that day. Wow. That train was so heavy that there were six maids of honor and there were, they actually sewed handles into the train. And those six maids of honor walked behind her carrying the weight of that train with all the gold in it when she walked into Westminster Abbey. I think it was Westminster Abbey. I think I'm right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Walked into Westminster Abbey to be crowned the Queen of England. She was the highest dignitary in the world at that time. Everybody would have looked at her and said, that is real royalty. Her train was only 21 feet long. His train fills the temple. Just, just get, get, get your mind, get your mind, get your mind, get your mind out of the natural and into the spiritual for a moment. His train fills the temple. That's who he is. That's his majesty. That, that's the grandeur of the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's why we can sing that song with all those different descriptions of who he is because he's so big, he's so grand, he's so magnificent. It's absolutely incredible. But you go on in that, on in that passage in, in Isaiah in, in verse 2. It talks about the seraphim who cover their eyes, have six wings and they cover their eyes and they cover their feet and with two wings they fly. And I, I want you to just, just think about that just for a moment. The glory of his presence is so powerful that even angels have to cover their eyes. His radiance is so bright that even angels cover their eyes because of the glory when they stand in the presence of living God. It's fascinating to think that two wings covered their feet. I suspect that's similar to Moses. Take off your shoes because you're on holy ground. Isn't it fascinating that when Moses goes up the mountain, and he asked to see the face of God, and God says, I'll kill you. <laughs> but I'm going to hide you in this little cleft of the rock. I'm going to cover you with my hand, and I'm going to let the backside of my glory go past you. Wow. Moses came down off the mountain, having seen just a backward glance at the glory of God. 
and his face is radiating so incredibly that they beg him to cover it up because they're blinding him. We're blinding by this thing that you've encountered, by this presence you've been in. It's so amazing. It's so powerful. It's so overwhelming. Please, Moses, put a cloth over your face. We just can't look at it. And that's a backward glance at the glory. Just, just with his hand covering you. What's he really like? What's he really like? And then the very next verse, it, it, it talks about what they're saying, and they repeat this incredible statement, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of your glory. And I, I don't think we, 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 culturally, we don't always grasp what we're hearing there. In, in English, when you're writing, if you want to emphasize a statement, you underline it, or you put it in bold, or you or you italicize it. But in a Semitic language, you emphasize somebody something by repetition. So Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you. When he says truly, truly, he, he's saying what I'm about to tell you is really, really important. Uh, so emphasis means this thing is important. The only attribute of God that's ever repeated three times is his holiness. We never hear love, 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 grace, 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 mercy, mercy, mercy. We hear holy, holy, holy. It, it, it means that his holiness is the most important attribute out of which every other attribute flows. So love is in submission to his holiness. Grace is in submission to his holiness. When we understand that, the holiness of God becomes this incredible, amazing revelation of who he is. I just love that they sang the song, holy, holy, holy this morning. <laughs> We're making a declaration that he is holy. Holy, holy, the whole earth is filled with his glory. When Isaiah gets in the presence of God, his perspective changes. And he starts seeing that finished revelation of the holiness of our God filling the whole earth. Now when we move out of that into what that means for us. If you forget who he is, we will never walk in true holiness. We will always distill it down to a set of rules we're trying to keep instead of a relationship with a God that is holy, holy, holy. Turn to your neighbor and say, holy, holy, holy. It's who he is. It's who he is. He's holy. I, I, I can't wrap my mind around an infinite God. I, we have a finite mind, so our finite mind means that I, I have limits to my ability to comprehend the infinite. And so when we look at the infinite, the infinite, we try to fit it into finite, and, and it doesn't fit very well. There are a lot of things in, the, in our doctrinal understanding that I suspect it's bigger than we are. I was just reading one of Randy's books, and he went through the revivals of history and the doctrinal positions of the revivalists and showed that there were equal number of conversions, baptism of the Spirit, no matter whether you were Armenian or Calvinist. Because somehow he's bigger than those labels. Those labels help me as a, as a finite person, but his infinite is bigger than my finite. But if we don't push our limits to start seeing the majesty of who he is, we're going to miss 
the relationship that he has for us. So Isaiah, out of his encounter with holiness, he, he begins to describe this ethical holiness that we walk in. And, and he describes it as a highway. Isaiah 53, uh, 35, 8. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will call, be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it. Isn't it fascinating that when we think of holiness, we think of a narrow way. But when Isaiah comes out of the presence of holiness, he says, there's going to be a highway. There, there, there's something we're building which can draw the billion whole soul harvest into relationship with the king of kings. This is bigger than the limitations of our mind. Yes, there's a narrow way. Yes, there's a narrow way that we come into. But what we're building is a highway of holiness. And this morning, I, I want God to just jog our thinking this morning to what that looks like. Now, I don't often go into history for prophetic words. And uh, I wouldn't call Paul Harvey a prophet. But I would like you to listen to a Paul Harvey clip from 1965. If I were the devil, if I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. And I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, the. So I'd set about, however necessary, to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who wanted until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious and what'll you bet? I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. When that was spoken, much of that couldn't even have been imagined. But everything on there is the reality that we live in. 
And that's the atmosphere into which God says, be holy because I'm holy. So what we gotta ask ourselves is, do we trust the word of God or do we listen to the culture around us? Because if we lose the biblical foundation, we're gonna be in trouble. And I believe that holiness is a call back to absolutes. It's a call back to a confidence the word of God is true, it's relevant, it belongs today to us. The problem with that has been legalism. Because legalism has tried to produce a holiness that's external, not internal. Legalism tries to bring people into conformity by putting rules in place instead of by dealing with heart issues. Most people in this room didn't go through the holiness movement, but the Pentecostal outpouring of Azusa Street in 1906 actually was an outpouring into the holiness movement. And so early Pentecostalism was birthed in a holiness environment. And much of that was external. I mean, I know none of you remember this, but no makeup or jewelry for women. No long hair for men. No slacks for women. No drinking, no smoking, no movies, no cards, no dancing. The list went on and on and on and on and on. But, and it's not that some of those things weren't accurate. They were external controls trying to bring restriction to get people to behave in a certain way. But Jesus himself says that we're not cleansed or defiled by what's outside, but by what's in our hearts. It's our thought life, our heart life, that is where holiness is determined, not external actions. I, I'm really not very interested in you conforming your externals if your insides aren't right. It doesn't have any, it doesn't have any merit, it doesn't have any value. Now, if you need to put restrictions on for the sake of getting somewhere, do it. If you need to be accountable for the sake of getting somewhere, do it. But the heart of the gospel is a heart change where holiness works from the inside out of us instead of from the outside into us. Holiness that starts externally doesn't tend to last very well. Isaiah goes further with this. In Isaiah 62, he, he kind of describes the the steps in getting to this highway of holiness. Look what he says. He says, go through, go through the grates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift the standard over the people. Okay, out of what we've done so far this morning, what are the two most important statements in that verse? Build up, build up, and go through, go through. Why are those things repeated? Because this is the key that makes the rest work. And, and as you read through scripture, when you see those repeated statements, take note, be, be careful, look at it, be careful, look at what it's saying. Because this is something that's gonna be really important for us. Now, now what I wanna do in, oh Jesus, 15 minutes. That means three minutes, oh Jesus. We're gonna do another round on this, I can tell already. I, I want to go through these five statements and I want to put them into a New Testament context because I believe if we understand what it takes to build a highway of holiness, it's going to change the way we behave. Look at the first statement. Go through, go through the gates. Ephesians says this, put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So the new self, my, my new identity 
comes with his amazing grace and the gift of righteousness. So when I put on this new self, I am putting on his righteousness, which means I'm holy. That's who you are. One of the great challenges in the church is many, many Christians are trying to become what they already are. Instead of being who they're created to be and then walking out in the good of who you actually are. I need to walk out the good of the righteousness I've received rather than trying to be righteous. When I'm trying to become what I already am, I will always live in frustration. I will always live in limitation. I will never, ever walk in the fullness of what he has for me. So when we speak of holiness in this kind of framework, we're speaking of a personal holiness, which is our walk before God, but we're also speaking of a social holiness, which is the way I walk before each other. So there's, there's always both elements to a walk of holiness. It's a vertical relationship with him, but it's also a walk with each other. The implication is that my vertical relation with God has got to have a horizontal outworking in my relationship with you. So the, the, the righteousness that I've received, I can reflect that righteousness in my relationship with those around me. So you should be seeing the behavior of a holy father lived out through the lives of believers. Not because they put on external controls, but because they've been in the presence of holy, holy, holy. And the presence of holy, holy, holy is having an effect on the way they live their lives. Many times when we've been in the middle of church conflicts, we deal with leaders a lot that are in in conflict with each other. And one of the questions I often ask is, don't you fear God? The attitude that you have to your brother, to your sister, to that family, to that other leader, aren't you afraid of God? When you've met holy, 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 you begin to respond to people from holy, holy, holy. We begin to see people with the value they have and not just the other things. It's so easy for us. Our, 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 it's so easy for us to see what's wrong in somebody. Our natural eyes see so quickly the faults and the failure in that other person. We see the places we don't agree with them doctrinally or we think they're off base or we think they're in a mess. But God, when you've been with the holy, holy, holy and you look at people, he begins to show you who they are. So we respond to each other differently. It's not that we don't correct and bring correction. Please don't mishear what I'm saying. But it changes our perspective of how we see people. When we understand holiness, we're going to look at that person because they've been created in the image of God. And they're absolutely amazing because they're in God's image. What is it of the image of God that person's carrying? And if we begin to relate to people on that level, we're behaving in a holy manner people. I, I think it's fascinating. I don't have time to do this, so I'm going to do it anyway. It's fascinating. When was this said? This weekend? This is what Mike Beckel said this weekend at IHOP. We're going to fit, spend the next few years cutting back on conferences so that we can focus on creating community and family. We want to slow things down and be able to really see each other and learn how to sit in front of the presence of the Lord. We want to learn how to be a family, how to stop for the one. 
We want to feel valued, celebrated, and honored. We want to major in the second commandment, loving each other and loving our neighbors. See, when Jesus gives the greatest commandment, it was to love God and love our neighbor. So the law is fulfilled in loving God and loving our neighbor. Therefore, holiness is fulfilled in loving God and loving our neighbor. I think it's fascinating that God spoke in the day spring next year to cut back conferences and to focus on family and relationship. And, and one, one, of the, one, of the re, one of the ways we know the spirit of God at work is when you hear different ministries around the nation using identical language for the next season that we're walking in. I was so encouraged when we heard that from, from what Mike Bickle just shared because it's exactly what Phil shared just a few weeks ago with us as a body. This is where we need to go. See, holiness requires this twofold function in how we behave. It's to love God and to love our neighbor. So holiness is in my worship and love for him. And it's my actions time to my neighbor. We're, when we're walking in holiness, when we're walking in with that heart and that passion, then we're walking in holiness. Then we're being sanctified. Um, we, we, I, don't, I get distracted here. Stop, Steve. The next statement in that Isaiah verse, clear the way for the people. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Since we have these promises, let, our, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness com to completion in the fear of the Lord. Debbie, jump for me down to the next one, build up the highway. I'm going to save that one for the next time we come. I need more time, otherwise I'm not going to get through that particular piece properly. Let me just say this much about clear the way. We live in a pro progressive culture which is seeking to redefine biblical truth. And we will not be able to operate in holiness if we don't trust the veracity of Scripture. Yeah. If we don't trust that what Scripture says is what Scripture means. And that, that doesn't mean we don't need to understand context. Context is incredibly important. We are a church that is absolutely bedrock that the Word of God is our foundation. But we are also a church that has women in our eldership and women speaking from this platform regularly. Amen. How do you reconcile that? You don't just decide that culture says women can do it, so therefore women can do it. You have to go into the Word and say, what does the Word of God say see that the same apostle Paul that said women should be silent in church said women should have their head cover when they prophesy so there must be a contextual difference otherwise Paul's a schizophrenic We're allowed to go into scripture and look at the context of what's being said. Amen. Say, God, what are you saying to us right now? How can we apply this that you're saying to us right now? In that Corinthians passage where when we read it, we read, you know, that women be silent and let them learn at home. And when we look at that passage in our culture, women be silent screams at us. In New Testament culture, when Paul said, let women be silent and let them learn at home, be silent would have been meaningless in that culture because that was normal. 
let women learn would have screamed at them. We've got to understand what was being said in that verse. When Paul writes to Timothy, and oh, not well, I'm go for it. When Paul writes to Timothy, he says, I, I, I'm not going to have women usurping authority over men because Adam was created first and then Eve. How do you understand that passage? Well, you got to ask yourself, where was Timothy? Timothy was in Ephesus. What was in Ephesus? Diana, the temple of Artemis, the cult of Artemis, one of the largest temples on earth, one of the wonders of the world was that temple destroyed in 270 AD or whatever. The temple of Artemis was a cult, and the foundation of that cult was that women were created first, and men came out of women. Clearly from what Paul's saying, because he starts out in First Timothy, be careful of all these crazy doctrines that are swirling around in Ephesus where you are. And clearly some of those women that come into the church and they're used to being in control, they're used to being the creators of men, and they're coming into the body of Christ, and Paul's writing Timothy and saying, be careful, there's a foundation that needs to be relayed, relayed here. And so in no way was it a permanent ban on women speaking in church. It was a dealing with Timothy in a context he's in. Church, we can't be afraid of looking at the context something was said in. We don't have women speak because of the, 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 the feminist movement. We have women on leadership in our church because we believe it's founded securely in the word of God. But that holiness has to find its foundation in the word. We can't just dismiss what we don't like. The second page is a really good page, but it would take me another hour to get through it. I knew it when I prepared I really knew it when I prepared it. I really did. Build up, build up the highway. We're not going to take any time over this right now. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. So that holy, holy, holy is supposed to leak into every single thing I do. It's supposed to leak into my activity. It's supposed to leak into my responses. It's supposed to leak into how I use my time. It's supposed to be in my relationships. It's supposed to be in how we use our finances. I was glad Phil talked about tithing this morning. Sally and I are so convinced of holy, holy, holy that before we go out of town, we write our tithe checks for the weeks we're going to be gone because of a relationship with holy, holy, holy. It's not out of fear. It's out of love and respect for holy. If the body of Christ would t try to stop making excuses for behavior and just start looking at holy, 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 it would change the way we live our lives. Whew. Remove the stones. Sorry, I know I'm jumping you quite a lot. We'll come back and do all that other good stuff later. Progressive Christianity wants to remove the stumbling stone of the gospel. But the stones that we remove have nothing to do with that. Amen. Remember when Isaiah is, is in the presence of God and he encounters holy, holy, holy. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Holiness starts right here. Right there. Starts with what I say, how we speak, 
The stumbling stone for the world around us is not Jesus. It's too often it's our own words. It's our negatives. It's our judgments. It's our criticisms. Those things that we let our mouth speak. As a nation, we're in the most divided moment in our history. There's so much trash being spoken. I'm not talking about your political position right now. How do we talk about people? Let's get back to know the holy, holy, holy. We'll talk about that more later. Lift up the standard. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. The body of Christ is to set a standard of the way we treat people, behave toward people. It's not a lowering of the standard, but it's a genuine treatment of people for who they are in God. Next time we'll look at some of the ways that I think the, 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 the church has been derailing holiness by some of our views of scripture and things, but we, we don't have time to do that this morning. This morning, I just want us to encounter the holy, holy, holy. The holy, holy, holy. Can we stand up together? If we have a worship team, could they come up? I don't always do that, but if we, if we do have a team today. Some of us need to encounter holy, holy, holy today. Some of us need to touch holy, holy, holy. As I was speaking this morning, did anybody just get a glimpse of holy, holy, holy? Did you get a glimpse of holy, holy, holy this morning? Tell you what, during worship this morning, I was rocked yes. by holy, holy, holy. I was rocked. Imagine Isaiah. The veil gets pulled back and he, he looks in and sees for just a moment this holy, holy. And he hears the sound of heaven, which emphasizes that incredible holiness flows from his throne. We want that holiness to touch us this morning. Just while worship, if you're in this room this morning and you're not in right relationship with Jesus, if you don't know him as holy, 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 if you know that you're not living right, there are things in your life that are definitely not holy, and this morning you want to come free of that. While we're worshiping, I'm just going to ask you to be real bold and just walk down the front right here. Before anybody else comes, I just feel like there's some people that God's touching this morning. Father, we love you and we worship you. 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 Holy. 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 Right now, if that's you, just come down the front. I believe there's several right now that God's speaking to. There's going to be some breaking off of some things this morning that have been historical things.
things that have held you captive. We're going to encounter holy, holy, holy this morning. Sorry, Melissa, I should have warned you on this thing. We can know. <laughs> I'd like to ask one of the ministry team to just get, come and stand with each person as they come forward. We're going to encounter holy, holy, holy today. as the worship team is singing this would you take time to talk to the person you're standing with and just walk them through a prayer walk them through just a response to this amazing 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 God walk them through into a deeper revelation of holy 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 just go ahead and pray with them right now as the worship team sings with me this morning, if you're hungry for more of a revelation of holy, 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 just raise your hand. I just want to pray together right now. Father, we thank you that you are holy, holy, holy. We celebrate your holiness this morning. Father, we're asking you by the power of your spirit 
that you would work holiness into us so that we would live from that place of holy, holy, holy. We acknowledge you this morning. We acknowledge your greatness. We acknowledge your power. We acknowledge your love in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Those who are parents, if you'd go get your children right now, that this would be a good time to do it. But if you're in this room and you need physical healing, would you just raise your hand wherever you are right now, anywhere around the room? Could I get two or three people to go to each of these hands right now? And let's just believe for physical healing to break out. In the presence of holy, 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 there is incredible healing. So look around you and find some hands, lay hands on that person. Let's just believe for complete healing to come right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. 